Hello, and welcome to our Twitch twine. Twining, twitching, twitching with twine. Yes, and here we are. Look Curriculum at that. Curriculum development yeah. world. So today, we've been talking about this for a while. We're going to, um, we're going to, well, we had built a character <laughs> last time, and we thought, well, that's nice. Now what? And we're going to twine today, but I think what we really need to do, we decided, is we need to build a world. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of these are reference sheets so our students can refer back and then know where to start from. Um, and then we'll get into all the, the fun twiny stuff. So I'm going to share our... Um, this brand new sheet we created. <laughs> it's really <laughs> exciting. Um, I'm just checking our mic there. Mic is on. Yes, maybe. Yeah, there it's it on. is. All right, uh, working. Mm -hmm. And I'll shrink our faces here. And look how exciting this sheet is. <laughs> um, I'm going to embiggen that a little bit so you can see just how fun and exciting it is. We're just starting with a blank page, which last time we started with a kind of a built-out page of our character sheet, which we actually worked on. And this time. Um, we put a lot of thought into this. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we did put a lot You're of right. thought into this. We did. Um, one of the things that we were talking about before we went on uh, Twitch was how to get students to start thinking about, or really how to place that character that we created into a twine game and, and what the intermediate step would have been, right? If we jumped straight in with a character there's no world for that character to exist in. Um, so as a result, we have moved towards uh, the creation of what we're calling a world building questionnaire um, and trying to get our students to think about, um, and questionnaire spelled wrong too, um, trying to get our, our students to think about no longer how the, or the world in which their character is going to occupy and not again this is a place where we're going to blend a little bit of their creativity but we also as we've kind of written about and talked about pretty frequently want them to create a historically plausible space um, so this world like the character they created should also be driven by a set of primary sources and some research that they have done prior to answering the questions that we're going to um, put into this questionnaire. Um, and so Jeff just offered up the first one. <laughs> I'm just thinking right. through this, we can change this, right? It's starting kind of big mm -hmm. um, and imagining where the, I don't know why I have these underlines, but that's terrible, but. Um, because I, you know, from our game space, we have a really good idea of where it's going to be. It's in it's in Washington D.C. Um, and I to to formulate that idea, this may be easy for some games. So, but I want to know: is it in Europe, which country, and then getting to which city or which area? And then mm -hmm. um, I think you know, is it urban or rural? Is a really basic question. It's it's maybe a bit too. Um, simplistic um, but then thinking about you know is it a cityscape is it a farmscape right. is it a suburban scape um, that way like we talked about last time um, it is um, a place they can start imagining I think that's really what we want them mm -hmm. force them to do is to have their imaginations visualize this which I think will make their storytelling a bit easier and the idea of having it plausible Right, maybe not realistic, but plausible, um, is really important. Well, and I think this right for, especially for the younger students, for the the survey students. I shouldn't say younger because some of my students are returning students. Um, yeah. But for those first year students, uh, their historical imagination hasn't been honed by other research and other historical interests. Right, so giving them again this uh, kind of thinking through this really for the first time as we've been uh, talking about this this questionnaire today 
um, but giving them maybe photos of like 19th century New York, mm -hmm. right? Or give them photos of 1860s Washington or the, the map of 1860s Washington, D.C. or wherever it is, right? And allow and have them try to describe that in words in a questionnaire like this. So not only are they visualizing it with real historical visual sources, but they're able to kind of um, illustrate that right in, in words or kind of to, to, to articulate in words mm -hmm. that I can't do. See, uh, <laughs> these places from those kind of, from that kind of photographic ev evidence, right? right. Getting yeah. them to, to read kind of photographs and, and articulate those or describe them so that their games are occupying essentially a real landscape um right that's Realistic driven landscape. yeah that's driven from his, the historical record yeah um, we often well we do have them cite whatever they're using mm -hmm. within their within their game so we can see that it's it's referential to something right. that was that was mm -hmm. that was simply. that existed yeah, yeah. um and often the hardest part for them, I think, to wrap their heads around sometimes is photographic evidence and, and images. So we've had quite a few games yeah. where you get these kind of, they want to views. decorate, yeah, they want to decorate the game. And, and I'm all for that. And I think it's a, right, it, it lends a, an atmosphere to the game, but often they're anachronistic or discordant. They don't fit with, because they can't find the right or they photo, don't know where or they to don't find know it. where or to they, find it I, or the, the the classic example this is maybe the worst example is i, I had a, a game this is an early iteration where someone's doing something where nat turner wasn't in the game but it was like a component of discussion right. and they put in a photo of nat turner now we, we right. understand the problem with that that's yeah. 1831 <laughs> the daguerreotype is until 1839 right and so they had pulled this from like a modern something. I a don't even know what. A modern movie or yeah. something. Yeah. And, but to them it was sort of this evidence of what this person looked like. Mm -hmm. And now that's maybe an extreme example, but I think it showcases the importance of kind of reiterating the, the function of primary evidence right. for them. And, I mean, honestly, if you're going to build a world, right, getting them to think – critically um about the world it's not just old new york it's not just right. right new york back in the day and any old photo can represent that that historical period right yeah. um it, it it is about trying to get them to hone and imagine that historical place um right and i think historical imagination is, is i ask my students pretty frequently like you know if you're in a large lecture course and you're lecturing on like today i was lecturing on rural massachusetts in kind of the mid-colonial period and I, I always wonder what the hell they're imagining as <sighs> that farmstead right what does that farmstead look like in their head what are they right if we're talking about the the witch trials where are the pop culture Where references they that they're drawing from as they imagine these spaces? Um, and, you know, a good portion of it's clearly going to be popular culture, right? So if it's the witch trials, I think there's, you know, popular culture references that they can make that, you know, are referential enough. Yeah. Um, but if it's something like colonial Massachusetts in the 1720s <laughs> right what do they have how do they how do they experience that um, and we're asking them in an, an assignment like this to imagine and describe these spaces which we wouldn't necessarily do in a midterm no not necessarily right? but or I... in a in a traditional kind of assessment right they're not they're not tasked with describing the place they're tasked with making a historical argument about cause and effect or change over time yeah and rarely are they put into the position right where they have to actually describe that space unless you're doing something like a first person right experiment with 
with that, which I've done before, and what you end up with it is the cold, dark morning fog. It was always cold over. and dark. Yeah, wow. <laughs> well, because it's an old timey, um, right? And fog is always cresting the dawn, um, kind of, kind of thing. It was and, dewier. It wasn't climate was change yet. <laughs> 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 but that did make me think of the last right. thing I wrote. I don't know how we could funk, work it in there, but how would you describe the economic space of the area residents community? Because they, I think, they kind of collapse all that into one and and why mm -hmm. urban spaces were much and you could argue were, were were more intermingled somewhat in there because of i mean in some ways right but the, how how can they then look at that space and think of what would be directly around them right like what would their neighbors be like like who are they going to encounter when they walk outside mm -hmm. um which I, I again we've talked about before they encounter just about everybody anybody and everybody <laughs> at any time yeah. um, and you know even if at the worst their games aren't like really good games i would really i would privilege the, the idea that knowledge. they could yeah. gain from understanding the period um and the limitations yeah and the historical right and what it looked like and yeah, because that's sounded it, it's like, about process, like, right? right? Yeah, and and so it may seem we're I don't know maybe asking a lot, but um, and maybe we are. I mean, I haven't. I, I yeah, we don't know yet, but I right. think we're asking the questions so we get things that are historicized and not kind of just generic. Generic. Yeah, I mean, what we've gotten in terms of exposition, what we've gotten in terms of place description is often not I mean, it's it's generic and not very in-depth um right um their characters start are starting to go that direction um but the place is always right you're in a part a victorian parlor um or something to the, of that nature um, right, and that, you know, I, I know what that means. I know what I'm imagining if they tell me I'm in a Victorian parlor or if I'm in a Victorian home. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> right, but I'm not sure if they, they are <laughs> know what they're describing. <laughs> yeah, right, because it just becomes, a, yeah, yeah, or it's a farm, right, or uh, a farm on the edge of a village, uh, or. Um, and I know where my brain goes if I'm if they're talking about the events leading up to the American Revolution and they tell me that their character is in a farm on the edge of Boston or something like that. To me, I kind of I can imagine that. Right. And that one or two sentences is enough for me. But is it enough? Are are this is, I mean, I guess this is meant to be kind of thinking this through, but is it enough for them, right? Do well, they know what they're describing when they say that? Well, I wonder, they don't know what far what's, is. Right, what's also. the distance? What's, yeah. But it's also the... But is, is that important? Um, yeah, I don't, know. I don't know. I think something like, yeah, it's like looking at the geography of Boston is so significantly different than it is now, right? Mm -hmm. It's all been filled in. And is that, that's not necessarily important as important is just kind of getting a general or a historically purposeful sense of the, the city yeah. yeah or wherever it is right so in in building a world like this i mean at least it grounds them right i mean that's i, I think that's the it's trying to ground them in reality and maybe for each of these like you know for each of these questions, we ask them to include a source. Yeah. That helps to answer the question. Right. So, is there a woodcut of the Boston street scene from the 18th century? Right. Um, could you take something like Revere's uh, Boston Massacre engraving and use that as a source that would help somebody build an environment, right? 
<clears throat> yeah. His vision of the North Church, his vision of Butcher's Hall, um, but the but you also have kind of those colonial townhouses along that e the edge there. You get a sense of what the street looks like. You have uh, colonial clothing on right. one hand. Right. You've got the red coats on the other hand. Right. I mean, there are cues that they could draw from from a source like that engraving that would allow them to maybe better imagine um, the world that they're creating and then having them find those sources that help them answer these questions would maybe lend even more to towards not only the research skills but kind of really find it, finding pointed descriptions of these spaces well for in the lower division class if you're providing them with a set of sources yeah. then you can give then them can a give set them, of images yeah. with different things that they can then right. pull from right yeah um from an, another class if the upper division they're going to have to hopefully Find they've thought things, about yeah. these things and, and it may or, to a different degree may or may not know how to read those right. things and it, it is the type of thing where um it, it, often students think images are easy to read, right? But um, it's really a training exercise <laughs> in yeah. getting them to think I mean, deeply about those things. Yeah, it's almost, right, I just typed in there you know, kind of a visual source board or almost like a visual pin board, right? <laughs> visual slash description pin board, right, where you're pulling sources from the era to try to help you make these and this is well right. it makes me think of this if you're doing this like i tried this with pinterest once a long time ago oh, geez. well back when pinterest was, has just started right i was thinking about ways of kind of leveraging the visual web for right. projects within a, like a lower division history class and and getting them to kind of visualize these spaces and visualize the past and um right so I think I think in that sense another thing there is and we keep using the word spaces spaces that uh, they may encounter and occupy so I mean up here has been kind of where are they living right and then this is kind of a question of where are they going yeah right that, that, that brings into the questions of like geographic mobility yeah and right. I think this which is we've hit upon in the character sheet, but right. now, you know, show me <laughs> what the scale of this space is, right? What's what's the scope of distance traveled in the game? Yeah. And how does that change? Because I mean, for a lot of these games, really, the scope should be relatively small, um, right? It the, should, and the only ones where there would be a lot of mobility are in those games, and and we see this where they start in some like Podunk farm town or something, and then they're in the next somehow in the next two passages are in the middle of Gettysburg um, <laughs> during the Civil War, right? That's a quick travel. <laughs> so, yeah, I know, yeah. I mean, you can just go to the train station and hit. <laughs> hit quick travel button. <laughs> I mean, but that goes into the idea if they're a certain class of individual, mm -hmm. they, they're not going to be able to, to do X. And so if they have built a character sheet that is a character who's lower class, they're not just going to go buy a train no, ticket. No, they're not going to get tra on the train. They're not going to have a horse. They're not going to have that kind of mobility. And their, their character's purview, the city that they occupy, the geographic space they occupy, it's going to have to be... Right, condensed, which is a really important thing <laughs> um, because I've had a lot of student games where the geography and the mobility huge. are huge. When right? most people, 8th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, aren't traveling more right. than like 50 miles outside. The of Seneca Falls, the, the, the students always want to do a Seneca Falls game, um, right? And they always want to have their character go to the meeting, um, right? And be at Seneca Falls. But they're starting in like <laughs> New York or 
in you know Chicago um, at Chicago that didn't really even exist yet um, and you know that distance traveled is pretty intense yeah, um, yeah. it's um, yeah I, I think too I, I, we keep talking like 18th 19th century games right and maybe it's because we're going but if we I mean this applies even to well, I'm, if you're I'm, doing a, a 20th century yeah. game I don't know if you, I presume, you, oh, you're not because of 172, but yeah. <laughs> I get, I get game, I've got many games set in the 40s and 50s and even 60s, mm -hmm. and, um, but even there, there's things to think about that really have to, are essential to those spaces mm -hmm. in terms of travel and economics, so this can be applied across the board. Across it could board, be a, sure. simple things yeah. such as... Um, you don't have a cell phone, right? <laughs> right? Which, which is different, which challenges how you communicate, mm -hmm. right? Or if there's even answering machines yet. Like there's basic little historical things right. that are necessary to think about, about well, the way people communicate information. Well, and, and access to technology. Right. Um, right. There's a, um, in um, one of the games that I had is, uh, this one was a 20th century game and it was, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it was set in Sicily, um, and it <laughs> turned out to be basically a mob shooter. Um, <laughs> so those are, those are popular, I hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in almost every scene, um, right, and this is Sicily in the at the turn of the century, um, right, an impoverished island <laughs> um, where almost every everybody had a radio. Uh, so there was the radio was in almost every room. The right and it was it's incredible, um, right? And so yeah, and and I guess that's what we're getting at. And and I keep bouncing back and forth about you know this is where the twine the whole twine curriculum thing is kind of where I I start questioning is like are these details important? Yeah. Right. Um, are we nitpicking at this level to get them? Well, what's important is the right. question. And I don't know. I mean, for me, you know, I, I'll forgive those things, even if we had a couple of questionnaires in the, the character sheet. I think you can forgive some of those things if you can see the work that goes into the creation of the game maybe right i mean <laughs> well i mean this is well so take this it is for a point we you, we played the game by someone before we started this right right and it followed the model of a particular game um but it left so much out out that it the that it was it could have like the framework was okay right right but it was so small and so limited and so decontextualized. Yeah, there's the you, you couldn't figure what was out what was going on. Um, that that you, there there's only so much you can yeah. uh, you know, do with that. Um, but I, I do I mean I get the same as like when I get a 1920s prohibition game, which yeah. I do not allow <laughs> anymore. <laughs> it is it it it's has been that. prohibited, <laughs> one might say. <laughs> Um, because it essentially becomes a movie. Or a movie. It, it, it does become it, a movie, right? I mean, a that's bad not, movie a about bad gangsters movie, yeah. or something like that. Um, where you know, I, I think that doing something like this might help because I really tried last time. I let someone do it last year, and I kept saying, "Okay, well, why don't we think about this from your primary character's perspective?" And you're saying, "Why don't we make them just?" I mean, a new Italian immigrant who experiences dim dis discrimination mm -hmm. of a particular time, and think what it meant for them to, you know, be within this this framework of of, of uh, nativist movements, yeah. Americanization, and and maybe he gets pulled into this. But let's think about why, what's happening why? in his yeah. world, his community, what the what's happening around him, and Can discrimination, right? Those things. Talk about the polit politics of the city at within the time. two frames. We... He's in the game. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> that's it? He, how did he... <laughs> but um, I think, and this is why maybe I'm always hopeful, is um, even if we get a setup that says, mm -hmm. you got to start here, you, you, this is your, your framework, yeah. you need to reference, then hopefully I think the idea is that pulls them back a little bit 
so not not to well, yeah I mean, forestall them but to no to make them think to give yeah. them that 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 couple of 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 beats to think about what and i mean hopefully to give them information that they can draw on so that as we do task them with creating the story that that story is rooted in even more right because i don't think and, and this is partly our fault and partly the fault of the discipline in some ways we don't train them to research place as much as we do to research cause and effect yeah change over time right which is you know kind of person driven or, or character driven rather than thinking about the external forces and, and i know historians think about external forces in context all the time but when they're doing research right for them those kind of external forces are often sidelined by the more personal st or the more personable stuff maybe yeah i don't know i'm thinking out loud at this no point, i i'm almost thinking of it i think that's fair you but if we think of this as a form of a, an assessment right mm -hmm. then what i'm mostly concerned about is them learning something about the historical process and that historical mm -hmm. era and the game is merely a function to do that right so whether the game itself is let's say just throwing out finished or even good does that really matter right well it, that's what i was trying to get at right i think at some point we had on a whiteboard somewhere in in here right that the goals of this kind of curriculum are in the creation part yeah not in the finished product sometimes right in that the finished finished product yeah like, i'm almost wondering like just turn in like i want to see your research and what you did with your research mm -hmm. and now i'm saying that must be in game form there's obviously a lot that goes into that game form so if, if particularly if we give them like these these different sheets and obviously this one isn't fleshed out but we have these ideas is i think that's part of it like going through that oh, and for then sure. and almost like you don't do it now but like stapling to it right the resources that then uh, justify oh, i do that validate I mean, earlier with the um with our old um uh, note cards the, no. the the we had a character development and yeah. kind of early yeah. like brief kind of world building quest kind of questions yeah. Yeah. that were more prompt based um and looking for like a paragraph and in right. those i would make them i would too i would make them layer yeah. the sources along so that they they were drawing these things from yeah right so they would have a, the first the first assignment was bibliography the second assignment was an annotate was to take that same bibliography and kind of whittle it down by writing annotations doing an annotated bibliography and in those annotations point to how sure yeah those sources right built the character or those sources built the world yeah but they weren't i mean then this is why we're doing what we're doing here right is that for me that wasn't as satisfying factory because it wasn't as explicit right as what i, I think, think we're this trying is explicit and so yeah. yeah i don't even think i don't even know if an annotated bibliography i want to is in, it, is, is necessary it. at this point no. because i really just want to see them build this and then show to me and maybe point to like right. just draw on it this is where i got it from yeah like like my notes look right <laughs> like if i look at my shit it's just you know they're they're arrows and points and then when I write a paper, okay, that's finished. But everything else is like right. a juxtaposition of ideas that I'm forming. And, but that formation process is really important. And I, maybe that's kind of what I'm thinking is that I, to kind of train, teach students to, to get to do that, that that's, right. that's the thing, right? That's what gets you through it helps you think Through about project, it and yeah. actually maybe make a breakthrough about how you're thinking about something. The breakthrough doesn't often come 
I mean, it does it sometimes. Does in the writing. In the yeah. writing, but you have to have that foundation, or mm -hmm. you have nothing to pull from, yeah. right? Um, and sometimes I think they see the annotated bibliography. Another thing is just merely a perfunctory mechanism that I'm supposed to do because right. it meets objective Y. But now what I really need to do for the grade is make this thing. Well, and this is, I mean, for me, one of the important things about this kind of a this project is I'm also trying to break them of that history student habit of thinking about history as a an argument already made hmm. and that their research is meant to prove a thesis that they've they've kind of already kind of drawn pre yeah that they, they're, they're drawn conclusions on right? right and and that they 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 go out to the library or they go onto the internet looking for those things that answer their question and that's not what i'm supposed to do <laughs> and that right that proves their th that proves that initial thought or that initial thesis right because i think they i, I why well, foundationally they know that the difference between a primary and secondary source right. they inherently they use them in ways that are merely to pull and to confirm leverage. what yeah. they are to leverage know, their versus to, just like yeah. oh wow that changes things. that changes right and i and that's what I, I think, and that's what an annotated bibliography send, tends to presuppose in some ways. Yeah, but it's so right. It it suggests that these are the answers. This is my right. answer sheet. Yeah. Um. And now, I can now my my answer I, sheet is full. It's it's been it's been <laughs> certified. <laughs> and I can then take my answer sheet and my thesis statement, and I can just run with it at this point in time. Um. Whereas a game, yeah. right? Because. I mean, we want these to be kind of thesis driven or argumentative yes. driven. What a purpose driven, right? Yeah. But there's right because this is so open ended and creative in some ways. The source material has often been right is it isn't being leveraged in that kind of evidentiary way to prove something that I already think. Yeah. Well, at least I'm hoping. I mean, in some ways, that's what I'm hoping. Something like this world building questionnaire would. Will will help them break maybe. Do you, I don't do you know. bring up the idea of what is the game's purpose? And when I say that, I think we talk about what it what it means is what is the argument you're making in here about this? Yeah, the position. I mean, that's that's of your kind player, of where right? we start, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're choosing a topic, what is what is the purpose of this topic, and why does it make a why will it make a good game? Right, right, or right a good historical game and. Um, right. In other words, what are people supposed to take away from, right, from this, from this experience? Um, what are we learning from it? Uh, right. And, but then again, when we start asking those kinds of questions, right, we're almost forcing them back into that predetermined, right. I'm making a game to suggest that the life of Native Americans was awful and the removal process was cruel and unkind, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then they're Good gonna job. just go pull all of that cruelty, right? And there's there's no there's no nuance. nuance. The idea is that they they it it, it right. is or it isn't right. right. It isn't in what ways was. Right. Uh, or how to what extent? To how what do extent, we? Yeah. Right. Right. Those broad, open questions that. Um, and I probably used the wrong example, but it's it's the it, it's an example, right? But it's it's like, I mean, I see this in freshman comp all the time, or in freshman history papers all the time, right? It's just um, I've got a thesis about the role of women, or I've got a thesis about the uh, you know enslavement of people on a plantation in the on a plantation and. It's all about just pulling everything. That everything just, that just reaffirms that thesis, which for young students totally cool, because I'm just getting them to think about argument and evidence, and the way that argument and evidence can change as you're doing this. But for our upper division students, really, I'm thinking about ways to to break them of some of those bad habits that are overlaid in. The survey course often 
what are you accusing me of? <laughs> not you. <laughs> I'm accusing myself as much, just as much, right? Uh, because you have them pre-build these thesis statements, and then <laughs> they have a set of sources that they're going to. <laughs> well, I think the idea with if wait, with the pre-built sources is there is no suggestion, right? That things would change if sources changed? No, there is or, that, but if yeah. they have these sources, that these sources don't tell a story. They are merely, there is no story until you make one. The story comes as you connect sure. ideas right. within the evidence. Now you go find what, what, what it you, is that connects. evidence is trying to say. Yeah. yeah, and how can you connect this to right. tell an interesting and compelling and evidentiary based story? And now if you look through this, you're going to get. I hope you guys, if you have groups, you're going to argue, hopefully, right. because you're <laughs> going to see different things. Right. Um, well, and that's what the group work is supposed that we're doing in some of our classes is meant to try to do, right, is to elucidate some argument over, right? So I had this just today, I had students in groups um, with a primary source packet um, that looked at the role of women in kind of that mid-colonial period. Um, in Massachusetts, uh, just after the witchcraft trial, just before kind of revolutionary, um, the, re the the revolution, and I'm still calling it the revolution, man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What are you gonna? You're like Gordon Wood it? over here. I am. Of course I am. <laughs> I grew up on Gordon Wood, man. <laughs> what else? What should I be calling it? The war of the <laughs> the war of rebellion. <laughs> What do you want me to be? <laughs> War of Independence. War of Independence, okay. <laughs> uh, no, uh, but um, <laughs> fine. <laughs> uh, criticize my teaching. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so in that, right, the idea is I've given them 10 or 15 sources. Each of them is supposed to choose three that speak to them in some way. And then they have a series of questions that they're going to answer as a group and they have to make a case for the sources that they've read. Sure. Right. right. Um, and the idea is to hopefully get them to see that somebody else might read a something set of different. a set of sources and get something completely yeah. different out of it than they did. And in doing so, they could each write a thesis statement. They could each yeah. use that evidence um, in an essay and they would both essentially be right yeah um, but that's what yeah. I a long time it's been like 10 mm. 12 15 years ago I mm. gave uh, students I had two document packs one on early Jamestown and one on Salem 1691 yeah. 92 yeah. and I broke them up into like groups of four and so there's about three or four groups with Salem and three or four groups with Jamestown and then let's see what kind of, you're this time they're just writing stories wins, writing yeah. narrative <laughs> and with arguments mm -hmm. and you, you and they start to see oh that group is saying something totally different, different than yeah than my group because i'm not talking to them and right. we're looking at it from a different perspective right. here um and i th i think that's why you know in lower division why packets can work, work. yeah um and i'm i'm still wondering i have we have to cut this right. soon but um about the great the assessment value, I, I right. think it is worth assessing. I'm wondering how we assess it. I think, it, I mean, and I have been doing this, especially in my lower division course. I put more emphasis on the build up work, yeah, than I do on the final. I think the final game is worth ten percent within the scope of the whole project, yeah, and the build up stuff is worth much more. Um, so if it's yeah, like, it if it's sense. like a hundred points, right? Um, everything leading up to it is going to give them the ninety points and the game itself, right? Because I don't. I mean, there's two things wrong with grading them on the game, right? One is the technological limitations that they're going to run into while they're trying to build the game, um, mm -hmm. and I don't want to penalize them for. You mean their yeah their their limitations yeah. right and i don't want to penalize them for that um and the other is that this is just an unfamiliar place to be writing so yeah um i'm i'm right i'm i'm excited by the games that they create but i'm also wary of the process in some ways yeah um so 
We're going to end it there. And yeah. maybe next time we'll actually talk. Do something. We'll, we <laughs> do we, something more. We can this. finish this. Yeah, we can finish this uh, document thing. And, and, um, all right. Find out. Cool. Ciao, people. Bye.